So first of all, thank you. Uh, what you did this afternoon was quite powerful. Uh, we've got a lot of great information. We're going to give you a headline only summary. Um, want you to know that all of the information we now have in our possession, we will be compiling it. Nothing that you said will be lost. The only thing lost will be the identification of the people that said it, so you're off the hook. Uh, secondly, uh, a couple people have asked about the feedback form. Uh, the Survey Monkey has already arrived in your email, so you do not need to fill this out and hand it back in. Just, uh, uh, just respond to the email uh, when you get it. Uh, and with that, let's, let's talk about what we heard. So first, here's who was here. Uh, almost half the people that participated today were from business. Uh, about a third were from education. About 20% uh, from government and the rest uh, other members of the community. So pretty interestingly diverse group. We asked you to, uh, at the beginning to talk about what are the big challenges? And these are not arrayed in, the or in any particular order. We we're just pulling them off the, the sheets real quick. Uh, so housing availability, a lot of conversation about housing availability and affordability. An awful lot of conversation about the availability of qualified applicants, uh, people with the necessary skills. Um, uh, youth migration of top students. Uh, many, many groups talked a lot about how uh, many of the top students in, in South Dakota go away for school and takes them a long time to get back and some of them never make it. Um, uh, the poor perception of technical education across the state. Uh, I thought one of the most poignant things I heard, uh, one person said, um, you know, I was on that task force in 1992 when we changed the name to technical institutes. But darn if we don't still call them Voc Tech. Old habits die hard. And that's a habit we're apparently carrying around, and that's challenging uh, technical education in our state. Uh, difficulties in attracting workers to the state. Uh, I heard a, a story in another group of a company that had the opportunity to go to a work site where 75 workers were about to finish employment. They had nowhere else to go. Uh, this, was, I guess, was in Oklahoma. Went down to recruit these people didn't get one of them to come to South Dakota. And why? Because it's too cold. <laughs> it's not too cold. We live in this, I live in Minnesota. We live in this climate, right? But it's the image. It's what people are carrying around. Job seekers lacking, lacking soft skills. You know, this is always the polite phrase for they don't come to work, they don't dress right, they don't communicate well, they don't know how to be punctual. Lots of issues that, that uh, people perceive. And, and some challenges in terms of the funding structures between career technical education and university funding and whether or not that is really adequate uh, to the task at hand. So challenges. Um, then, then, of course, we wanted to focus on, well, what's working? And uh, frankly, this was in many ways the hardest list for us to process over the last hour because there's lots of stuff that's working. So again, think of these as only headlines, not a definitive uh, list. So internships, apparently many of you in business are engaging uh, with young people and job seekers and giving them a chance to sample uh, the possibilities and that's considered quite powerful. Tuition reimbursement policies, an awful lot of you again are, apparently are using tuition reimbursement as a way to help people build their skills but also to retain people. Uh, the RTEC uh, is seen as a very successful collaboration between uh, technical education and employers sort of a talent pipeline, actually putting employers and educators in a place to, to meet one another's needs. Uh, English as second language training, we heard earlier today about the, uh, the movement of migrant folks into South Dakota and the importance of uh, ma making sure that they have the language skills to succeed. Uh, a whole bunch of awareness building and training things that people identified. The, the one that caught my attention was these mobile learning units, these. Uh, trailers and campers that are going around the state giving young people a chance to actually sample things, to see what this work is really like. And dual credit programs that make it possible for a young person to get credit for not only going to high school, but to advance their opportunities in post-secondary. So lots of things uh, going on that seem to be uh, working fairly well. 
Then we, we concluded uh, the afternoon with conversations about what could we look for from each one of the sectors that, that might actually be able to turn the dial, and might actually be able to make a difference in terms of our workforce issue. So again, uh, just headlines. Uh, from, from the point of view of business, uh, you would recommend that business uh, be even more aggressive in terms of its uh, commitment to training, uh, both in-house and the use of uh, government-supported training programs. Uh, this is sort of the notion that the best place for people to get trained is for a job they actually have or a job they actually aspire to that is in uh, perhaps in, in one of your businesses. Uh, we saw that internships were rated as something that's working and there's a, a sense that we ought to keep that up. Uh, uh, we did learn, that we had an interesting conversation uh, during the last hour about the difference between internships and apprenticeships and that those words come flowing out like we actually know what we're talking about. Think of internships as uh, giving people access to possibilities. So it's really about introducing, it's introductory kind of work. Apprenticeships are preparation. They're actually with people who are on a track uh, to move into a career or to move into a job. So internships, apprenticeships are cousins, but they're not, they're not the same thing. Another uh, recommendation uh, uh, was really about building much stronger partnerships between business and education, specific partnerships, not something in general, but actually connecting these institutions and the work that they do to one another. Uh, tuition funding, uh, tuition reimbursement, we talked about that a second ago. And, uh, and being engaged, having the business community directly engaged in raising awareness in all of our communities about the kinds of jobs that are out there about their potential, about salaries, about opportunities, and so on. And in the, in the data that we looked at, it was pretty clear that you all believe that awareness raising is not just focused at young people, but certainly at their parents as well. As, as we heard earlier today, you know, we remember things as they were when we last saw them. And I remember well the last time I participated in welding and I'm pretty sure it's not the same today. <laughs> um, and so if I were to talk to my kids about welding, I would be so wrong, but it would feel right to me. My daughter once said to me, Dad, you don't understand the difference between current events and ancient history. Because <laughs> it all seems like current events to you. Just to illustrate this, I'm sorry to take this little divergence, but uh, when my daughter uh, enrolled in ninth grade, I went to you know, parent night, and. And the teacher said, you need to remember that the Vietnam War is to your daughter what Warren G. Harding was to you <laughs> when you were in ninth grade. Current events and history. And, and we're prisoners uh, in many ways of our own history, even though our intentions are different. So strategies for business. What about education? Well, there, there's this strong sense uh, from all of you that business educators and counselors need to be engaged in a, a real campaign to change perceptions about, uh, about work, the world of work, the requirements for work, and the opportunities in work. And that this is not something left to one sector or another, but really needs to be a joint effort. Job shadowing, uh, and really encouraging um, educators to understand the world of work the world of business, the world of manufacturing and, and other businesses, uh, so that they have uh, the chance to pass that on to their, their students. Uh, infusing life skills and soft skill training into the education system even more strongly than it is today, so that uh, young people are not just graduating with uh, technical skills or capabilities, but act actually are graduating with a disposition uh, to be successful at work, to understand about showing up on time and being polite and uh, tucking in your shirt sleeves and uh, uh, or shirt tails and, and all the other things that go into being successful in the world of work. And continuing to expand dual credit programs. Uh, this you identified as a strategy that's working, but there really seemed to be a sense <laughs> among you that this is one of those things that ought to be uh, done and that things like uh, career technical education ought to be treated with the same respect as things like advanced placement, that they ought to be uh, manifest in, in the same way. They ought to show up on a transcript in the same way. They ought to be important in the same way. I thought one of the more interesting things I heard from, from one of the groups was the notion of uh, everybody should graduate with high, from high school with some initials after their name. 
Uh, so it might say AP student if you graduated with advanced placement credit, but why not, why not uh, graduate with NCRC, right? The National Career Readiness Certification. Why wouldn't that be on my business card when I graduate from, and why wouldn't every high school graduate get a business card that would manifest their capabilities and credentials that they could use in the community? And think about the process of doing that, what one would go through to, to have a business card that was worthy of, of passing out. Just one of these ideas I heard in one of the groups that caught my attention. So lots to be done with educators and the education community that can also advance a, a workforce agenda. How about the government? Well, there was a, a several a, a pretty powerful ideas. One was about realigning the investment in career technical education, making sure that the resources really are available to expand these programs and make them available. Uh, working with communities to target specific and diverse uh, potential work groups. So veterans, a lot of people talked about uh, the disabled, uh, immigrant populations, other populations, uh, persons of color in our communities, non-English speakers. There's the, somebody in one of the groups said, you know, the future workforce in South Dakota is in South Dakota right now. And, and you're all doing a lot to recruit people into South Dakota, but there's thousands, literally tens of thousands of people in South Dakota that are either not connected to the workforce yet or are too, long, too young to be connected to the workforce. There's a great opportunity there. And one of the roles of government is to help the larger community engage uh, with those folks. One interesting conversation was about uh, South Dakota's marketing dollars. Now, I happen to live in Minnesota, so I get to see the commercials about Mount, Mount Rushmore and the beautiful Golden Plains. And, uh, and actually, I don't need to be convinced. I come here all the time. But this group was saying, you know, if we're going to spend money on marketing, let's market the economy of South Dakota. Let's market the opportunities of South Dakota. Let's market the workforce of, of South Dakota, and let's market the quality of life of South Dakota, not for people to visit, but for people to make part of their life. And again, an interesting idea. And uh, another one was about grants for encouraging students to stay in South Dakota. Several of your neighboring states provide uh, tax incentives, actually, uh, for young people who, who uh, may go out and borrow some money and, and get an education, and if they stay in their home state, they get an income tax credit to help offset those costs. And it's obviously an encouragement to try to keep people at home. So again, these aren't, you know, these are ideas. These are what they are. They're not even recommendations at this point. They're ideas that people were sharing about the role that government might play. And then finally, what about others in the community? And in, in uh, several of the groups that I listen to, there's a lot of talk about ambassadors in the community that if you think about our communities, there are always these people who are kind of the connectors. There's always people that fill this role, even if they don't have a title or anything like that. Well, how can we use that, those networks to make our communities even more welcoming, especially when we're trying to encourage people to move to our communities and take jobs? Uh, people who may not be familiar with, uh, with our places. How do we use these, um, you know, the old fashioned idea was the welcome wagon, but how do we use these ideas to help uh, make our communities as welcoming as possible? Uh, and uh, secondly, a community-based awareness campaign where everybody in the community is engaged in helping young people and, frankly, uh, us older folks understand about the world of work today as it is and encouraging our young people to take advantage of those opportunities. And then amenities for young people. I learned loud and clear that the place to be in the summer is Rapid City on a Thursday night. And I'm intended to be there. <laughs> It sounds fabulous, and it's a secret. And you need to let this secret out. Well, maybe you don't want to, but you ought to, because it's the, exactly the kind of thing that's going to bring a young crowd in, and it's going to convince our young people that this is really a fabulous place to live, uh, to enjoy yourself, that there's all kinds of opportunities. So how can we use the amenities and opportunities in our communities to make them even more attractive uh, to the young folks that, that need to come and be part of our future. So just a couple of other um, notes before, before we turn the program back. Um, a couple of other interesting sort of uh, ideas that came up that I just wanted to mention. Um, the first was the idea of creating a workforce manual or a, a, a think of it as an app that uh, every, every young person ought to get. Everybody ought to have a, a sort of a user's manual to a career. 
uh, and this is what you do, and this is how you do it, and this is how it works out. And um, I, I know the work that Melody and others have done to create vignettes and the stories could be folded in to make it even more interesting and attractive to people to think about how you manage yourself into a job and then into a career over time. That, I heard someone raise that idea. That seemed pretty interesting. Uh, in one community, they'd organize what they call the Young Guns. So a young professional's organization, a young person's organization. Uh, it's all part of that thing of how do we uh, capture and keep young people in our communities and make them part of the, part of the force that grows our communities. Uh, so lots of ideas. And, and what we want you to know from this is that your identification of challenges, things that are working, and all these ideas are going to be compiled as part of the final uh, report that we'll assemble uh, that we'll turn over to the governor and so on. But I want to leave you with one assignment. Uh, beyond all this. Um, there's no reason why you would know this, but sometime back I was the uh, superintendent of schools uh, for the schools in Minneapolis. And uh, I got the greatest education of my life uh, being the superintendent of schools. And one of the greatest lessons was uh, one afternoon I was out wandering around our schools and walked into a second grade classroom, which was they were just, uh, kids were just on fire. They were, they were learning so much and learning so fast, you couldn't help but be glad that you were among these kids. And, and the teacher did the one thing I always didn't want them to do. She stopped what was going on. And she turns to the kids and says, boys and girls, we have a, a very important visitor. We have the superintendent of schools. Does anybody know what the superintendent does? And I was really curious to hear the answer to this question. <laughs> I had not trained to be a school superintendent, so any job description was good enough for me. And it turned out, turns out that if you ask second graders a question, it doesn't matter what the question is. They're going to answer it. So she says, does anybody know what the superintendent does? Every hand in the room went up. And I'm thinking, holy schmoly, how could they know so much? And I know so little. And there was this young kid sitting right where Jake is. His name was Robert. And Robert was one of those kids that just knew that he knew. <laughs> and he had his hand up, but he just knew that he knew. And he just couldn't wait, so he jumps up and he says, I know. And the, t the teacher says, OK, Robert, all right, all right. What's the answer? Robert says, the superintendent is the guy in charge of Super Nintendo. <laughs> uh, this teacher was no dummy. She turns to Robert and she says, Robert, that was a very creative interpretation of the language. <laughs> really good, Robert. She says, but actually, the superintendent is the leader of our schools. Does anybody know what a leader is? Every hand in the room went. And now I'm really fried. I have no idea what's going to happen next. And way back there, I mean, as far away as you could possibly be, was a young woman with her hand raised so high that I was sure she was going to dislocate her shoulder. I mean, she was just, and thankfully, the teacher called on her, and, and she stood up, and her name was Ariana, and, and she gets herself all squared away, and the teacher says, OK, Ariana, what's a leader? And she doesn't hesitate for a second. She says the following words, this is a second grader. A leader is someone who goes out and changes things to make things better. That was my reaction, too. I wrote it on my hand. <laughs> this felt, I mean, I'd been to leadership school and flunked out twice. I, I read all these books, and no one until this second grader had ever offered up such a powerful, single definition, change things and make things better. I raced back to the headquarters of the school district, where by accident we had a meeting of all of our school principals. So I come running in, as I was wont to do, and I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, I have good news and bad news. What do you want first? Give us the good news. I said, the good news is I got our job description. It's right here. Change things and make things better. They said, well, that's great. What's the bad news? I said, the bad news is the second graders already know. <laughs> Your communities already know. I can see it in your eyes. They know who you are, and they know what you're capable of doing. And they believe that if you come together as you did today to focus on any problem, you can change things and make things better. That's all they ask, and that's plenty.
and I commend you to this work. This has been an inspiring day for us to see the, the passion and commitment to this subject. But I leave you with Ariana's challenge. It's not enough to be here and admire this problem. It only matters if you go home and change things and make things better. Thank you very much. Uh, difficulties in attracting workers to the state. Uh, I heard a, a story in another group of a company that had the opportunity to go to a work site where 75 workers were about to finish employment. They had nowhere else to go. Uh, this, was, I guess, was in Oklahoma. Went down to recruit these people. Didn't get one of them to come to South Dakota. And why? Because it's too cold. <laughs> it's not too cold. We live in this. I live in Minnesota. We live in this climate, right? But it's the image. It's what people are carrying around. Job seekers lacking, lacking soft skills. You know, this is always the polite phrase for they don't come to work. They don't dress right. They don't communicate well. They don't know how to be punctual. Lots of issues that, that uh, people perceive. Just, uh, uh, just respond to the email uh, when you get it. Uh, and with that, let's, let's talk about what we heard. So first, here's who was here. Uh, almost half the people that participated today were from business. Uh, about a third were from education. About 20% uh, from government and the rest uh, other members of the community. So pretty interestingly diverse group. We asked you to, uh, at the beginning to talk about what are the big challenges? And these are not arrayed in, the or in any particular order. We were just pulling them off the, the sheets real quick. Uh, so housing availability, a lot of conversation about housing availability and affordability. An awful lot of conversation about the availability of qualified applicants, uh, people with the necessary skills. Um, uh, youth migration of top students. Uh, many, many groups talked a lot about how uh, many of the top students in, in South Dakota go away for school and takes them a long time to get back and some of them never make it. Um, uh, the poor perception of technical education across the state. Uh, I thought one of the most poignant things I heard uh, one person said, um, you know, I was on that task force in 1992 when we changed the name to technical institutes. But darn if we don't still call them Voc Tech. Old habits die hard. And that's a habit we're apparently carrying around, and that's challenging uh, technical education in our state. So first of all, thank you. Uh, what you did this afternoon was quite powerful. Uh, we've got a lot of great information. We're going to give you a headline only summary. Um, want you to know that all of the information we now have in our possession, we will be compiling it. Nothing that you said will be lost. The only thing lost will be the identification of the people that said it, so you're off the hook. Uh, secondly, uh, a couple people have asked about the feedback form. Uh, the survey monkey has already arrived in your email, so you do not need to fill this out and hand it back in. Just and, and some challenges in terms of the funding structures between career technical education and university funding and whether or not that is really adequate to, uh, to the task at hand. So challenges. Um, then, then, of course, we wanted to focus on, well, what's working? And uh, frankly, this was in many ways the hardest list for us to process over the last hour because there's lots of stuff that's working. So again, think of these as only headlines, not a definitive uh, list. So internships, apparently many of you in business are engaging uh, with young people and job seekers and giving them a chance to sample uh, the possibilities, and that's considered quite powerful. Tuition reimbursement policies, an awful lot of you, again, are, apparently are using tuition reimbursement as a way to help people build their skills but also to retain people.